This morning's reading is taken from the Old Testament book of Daniel, reading uh, chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of King Joachim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord let King Joachim of Judah fall into his power, as well as some of the vessels of the house of God. These he brought to the land of Shinar and placed the vessels in the treasury of his gods. Then the king commanded his palace master, Eshpanaz, to bring some of the Israelites of the royal family and of the nobility, young men without physical defect and handsome, versed in every branch of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and insight, and competent to serve in the king's palace. They were to be taught the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the royal rations of food and wine. They were to be educated for three years, so at the end of time they could be stationed in the king's court. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, from the tribe of Judah. The palace master gave them other names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine. So he asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself. Now God allowed Daniel to receive favor and compassion from the palace master. The palace master said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king. He has appointed your food and drink. If he should see you in poorer condition than the other young men of your own age, you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel asked the guard whom the palace master had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. You can then compare our appearance with the appearance of the young men who eat the royal rations and deal with your servants according to what you observe. So he agreed to his proposal and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was observed that they appeared better and fatter than all the young men who had been eating the royal rations. So the guard continued to withdraw their royal rations and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and skill in every aspect of literature and wisdom. Daniel also had insight into all visions and dreams. At the end of the time that the king had set for them to be brought in, the palace master brought them into the presence of Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among them all, no one was found to compare with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they were stationed in the king's court in every matter of wisdom and understanding concerning which the king had inquired of them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel continued there until the first year of King Cyrus. I've got a few other Bibles here if anyone wants one. It's page 851. Wendy. Shall we pray as we approach God's word together? Father, we ask that you would give us wisdom as we listen to your word. Help us to take what is ours and to act upon it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Daniel's difficult day. Daniel drawing a line in the sand, and as Dave said, Daniel is the beginning of our discipleship uh, series over the next term. We're going to look at five different characters over the next five weeks, um, and how they did their discipleship, how they followed God in the midst of their situation. The second part of our discipleship series, we're going to be looking at our front line and trying to decide where it is that we most often practice our discipleship. As Neil, the fellow on the first video, was saying, we are mostly not in here. And I want you to do a quick mental 
assessment, mental, what do we call it, uh, inventory of your life. <laughs> Just briefly. Um, this week, how much time are you going to spend in bed? Let's think per night. Times that by seven. I was going to bring you paper if you can't do mental maths. Seven sevens, 49, so about 49 hours in bed. How long are you going to spend at work for those of you who go out to paid work? How long are you going to spend at the shops? That's a tricky one for me, I don't know. Could be a lot this week or maybe, maybe I shouldn't. Um, how long are you going to spend in front of a screen somewhere? Is that one hour, two hours a day, three hours a day? Emails? So times that by seven, seven threes, that's 21 hours. So I'd love you to go home and actually write that down somewhere. And because I want you to think, and through these, these discipleship series, I want you to think, where are you spending the majority of your time? Because that's going to be key as we think about how we are disciples in that place. Daniel, of course, was a disciple not of Jesus Christ because he hadn't been born then. Daniel was an Old Testament character, lived a long time before Christ, and was part of the people of God. He was a Jew, and he was also a Jew that suffered the exile. The land of Judah had been overtaken, and the king of Babylon had carried off the best, the good, the greatest, and taken them back to Babylon and enrolled Daniel and his three friends into a kind of university situation. Three years, three years study, three years study of the language and the literature. So he was doing a Babylonian degree, not an English degree. He was doing a Babylonian intensive course so that he could become part of the Babylonian culture. It's an interesting thing when we think that we're in the midst of times when people are leaving their homelands and moving to a different culture. When we see all those refugees moving out from Syria, from Libya, from Nigeria, and moving into a new, completely different culture in Germany or in Europe in various places. I wonder how those individuals feel about what is important to them. What makes them them? What are they going to be prepared to give up in order to be part of that new culture? And what are they going to hang on to that is absolutely essential? Because I think that's something of what we see with Daniel. Daniel has gone to a new place. It's a strange foreign land. And it's interesting, we don't often think of ourselves in a foreign land, but perhaps we ought to. Oh, we all know what Marlowe's like, we all know what it's like to live in England, we all know um, the, ways, the way we do things around here, that's what our culture is, we know how to turn a telly on, we know that the 10 o'clock news is always sound. Um, you know, we, we've got our ways of doing things. But... Perhaps God is saying, you are in fact a citizen of another place. A bit like Daniel, he knew that he was a citizen of the people of God. He was a member of the Jewish family. He was a Jew first and foremost. What are we first and foremost in this strange land? Are there bits of the culture that have infiltrated and squashed us into a new mould? And I think this is my first point I want to make. We need to recognise that as Christians, we are living in a strange land. We're living in a land that's got different values to Christian values, different customs, different gods. Technology is such an amazing, amazing thing, but has it become the God of our age? Is everyone so focused on emails and laptops and internet and um, all the latest gadgetry that we lose sight of what it is there for? Connection. 
talking to people, actually being with people, developing relationships. They've become things that have distracted us from the kingdom that we are part of, God's kingdom. In the kingdom of God, these are some of our our customs, our values. Blessed are the peacemakers. The last shall come first. The pure in heart shall see God. The fruit of the Spirit is what we're looking to see grow in our lives. Forgiveness. These are all part of the kingdom of God that we don't necessarily see in our culture as the most important. So perhaps like Daniel, we need to recognize that we are in a strange land. The only way to recognize things, I think, is to be aware of what the real is. What is the real that we are part of? And so I urge you to talk, learn, study, know with your brothers and sisters what the real thing is, the real kingdom of heaven, the real kingdom of God is all about. And then you'll be able to recognize the strangeness of the place that we live. Well, secondly, that was Daniel in a strange country. Daniel's identity was being squashed. And the second point, I think, is like Daniel, we need to know if we're going to be good disciples out there on our front line, we need to know whose we are. Daniel's identity as a Jew was being pressurized. And in, in verse um, 6, it says that the, um, the palace master gave them, or that's seven actually, the palace master gave them other names. And the first thing you know when your identity is being squeezed, when you've been given a different name, we are, in part, our names signify something about us. Some of us don't like our names. <laughs> But that's what we've been given. That's what we've grown up into. That's who we are. And Daniel felt that his very being as a, as a member of the family of God, as a member of the people of God, was being squashed and squeezed. So he, with his brothers and sisters, well, his brothers, his three brothers, Meshach, Meshach Shadrach, and Abednego, which I remember from Sunday school days as shake a bed, make a bed, and a bed we go. Um, (laughs) Those three, and Daniel, now called Belteshazzar, they together made a decision that would help them keep their identity. I don't know how many of you... um, get into television programs, get into um, box sets or series. I don't know. Are there any Trekkies in the house? Do you know what a Trekkie is? There's one Trek. Peter, bless you. (laughs) Trekkie, somebody who watches Star Trek. And actually, you can become defined by watching Star Trek. You become known as a Trekkie. You might even go to conventions. You might even buy outfits. And you begin to get squeezed into a sort of Trekkie mold. Well, I'm trying to break out of it because that's not my prime identity. In one of those Star Trek episodes, you'll be pleased to know, the captain of the Starship Enterprise is captured by the Borg, an invincible alien hive collective mind. They come in a very square-shaped ship, and he is made to be one of them. He is assimilated He's given an eyepiece and an ear thing, and he's given an electric uh, robot hand that can shoot people and do all sorts of nasty things. He's assimilated into this new culture. But there's just a very little bit of Jean-Luc Picard, very deeply buried, that has held on to who he is. And when the crew rescue him back again, bring him back on the Starship Enterprise, they have to hold him down so he doesn't kill them all and try and make them all into the Borg. And he gives them a clue. He can only bring out one word, and it is sleep. And it's the miraculous answer that they put the Borg to sleep by infecting them through the hive mind. There you are. You've had the whole story. It's very exciting, and I love it. You can tell. But what's that got to do with us? (laughs) We need to keep 
part of ourselves. We need to keep ourselves in touch with God. And for us, it shouldn't be the last tiny bit. But maybe that's where we've got to. That's all that's left, a tiny communication with God our Father. Maybe we feel that we've been brought away, brought out of contact with brothers and sisters. But when we're together, we re-establish our identity. We know whose we are. We know that together, we are the forgiven people of God. Together, we are the loved children of God. On our own, we are that too. But together, we reinforce that in each other. We encourage one another. We encourage one another that we are free from sin. We're free from guilt. We're stood righteous in God's sight. That means we've got right standing with God. He looks at us and sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's who we are. And that's, we need to know whose we are. So when we're not together, we know that same thing when we're out in our frontline positions. So what did Daniel do? And this is the the final thing. So we've thought about recognizing the strange land, knowing whose we are. We need to, like Daniel, resolve in our heart what we are going to do to stay in touch. In verse 8, it says, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine. So he asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself. We don't often think about being defiled by the outside world, do we? We just kind of live in it and we try and just do nice things and be nicely Christian. But if we're not careful, the ways of the world begin to rub off on us. We begin not to behave as Christians. We begin not to love. We begin not to be self-sacrificing. Dave was speaking last week about picking up our cross, denying ourselves and serving others with all our heart. And it's so easy to get into the way of the world, which is, well, I will look after other people. I do do love other people, but not not all of me. Not not all of that I am. I'll just keep a bit for myself. I've got to keep strong. I've got to keep, um, you know, well. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge to listen to God. What does he want us to do to serve our neighbor, to love with all our heart? For Daniel, Daniel in his strange land, he couldn't do everything that he would have done as, a, as part of the people of God. He couldn't go to the places of worship, but on his own, he could kneel and pray at his window three times a day. And he could ask, he couldn't ask for kosher food. I don't think they had kosher in those days, but they certainly had regulations about what you could eat, no pork, no shellfish, and how to kill your meat and what to eat. So he couldn't ask for the meat to be done his way, but he could ask to stand up against that and just to eat vegetables. That's, that was his stand against total assimilation. That was his way, his outward symbol of saying, in my heart, I am still part of the people of God. I will still do what I can to remain a godly um, part of the people of God. So, when we are out, when we have recognized our strange land, when we have determined and resolved in our heart that we will be faithful disciples. That's the point where we need to be praying and asking God to show us what are the things that are drawing us away, distracting us, defiling us in terms of our Christian faith. It will be different for each one of us. For some, it will be watching stuff on telly that we just know we shouldn't watch. For some, we'll know that we're spending too much time away from the family on screen time. For some of us, it will be that we've got distracted by the gods of luxury and Hobbes designer dresses. I speak for myself. 
There are all sorts of things that will distract us and take us away from what God wants for us, his best for us, his, what he wants to make us as disciples. So resolve in your heart that you're going to listen to him, to follow him, to stand up for being a disciple on your front line. Know whose you are. You are beloved children of God. God could not love you anymore. You could not be any more freed from sin, from guilt. You are his children, and together we are his children. And in that strange land of ours, go out and honour God and bring him glory. So let's pray. Father, as we learn together how to be your disciples, strengthen our resolve. Help us to be always aware of your loving presence with us. And help us to recognize where our culture, the ways of this world, stand against your ways. And in our lives, help us to follow you and to bring you glory in everything we do, we say, and we think. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, Wendy. You've given us a a lot of different things to think about there. And I I think... um, as the, Martin and, and Simon are going to come up in a moment and lead us in our last song. But as they do, I just wonder what you're thinking your response is going to be to what, what you've heard this morning. Um, maybe you've just moved to Marlow and you're thinking, well, I, I want to make you know, church a regular part of my life. Maybe you've come back from the summer and you think, well, actually, I haven't really made much space for God. I've had a bit of a holiday from my faith. Maybe you've been thinking about parts of your life where actually you haven't really let your faith into. And um, I think the best way to respond to that is, is to resolve, as Wendy was saying, I'm going to do something differently. And to tell someone, maybe tell the person you're sitting next to, I'm going to do Alpha. Or I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to listen to every week of these talks. You know, they're on our website. You don't have to come here to listen to them if you can't be in Marlow. I'm, I'm going to really think this through. So if that's you, I'd encourage you, make a resolution and stick to it, because there's something about going through those green doors that can wipe from our minds all the good intentions that we have. Is it just me? No, I think we all do that. So make a resolution and stick to it. That's how lasting change happens. Or maybe this thing about um, your own identity. Who am I deep down? What have I been turned into? What of these, this pain that's happening in my life, what's that doing to me? Maybe you need some time to think and pray and ask God, you know, who am I deep down? Where can I take a stand uh, in my faith? And if that's you, I'd encourage you to have that conversation with God, either in the pews where you are or in our prayer chapel, newly carpeted, um, over to the side here, where the prayer team would love to pray with you. I'm thinking as well about immigration, which is so top of mind. And if you're like me, you're thinking, what can I do? Actually, there are lots of things that we can do. We can sign petitions. We can, there's stuff that's gone on our 1059 Facebook page this week about a family who have set up a privately run search and rescue operation. And they're looking for funding for that. But there's one thing we can always do, which is to pray if we believe it makes a difference. So I'm going to suggest right at the top of church there, we leave that space. If you want to pray, either on your own or with other people, about this immigration crisis, then why not just spend a few minutes there after church and think, right, if there's the only one thing I can do this week, I'm going to pray that there will be a breakthrough and something will change.